Um, so hi, welcome everyone. I think we've got uh, nearly 20 people in the room already and about another 20 who've said they're planning to attend. Um, so as Tom said, I'm uh, the editor of David Fleming's posthumous books. Uh, he passed away back in 2010, very suddenly actually, he was one of my closest friends. And um, Lean Logic, the, uh, the epic dictionary for the future and how to survive it, that was his life's work. Um, that was, yeah, something he'd worked on for 30 years uh, and never quite got published. And so after his death, I took on bringing that to publication and then um, and then also working with the publishers, edited out from that, this paperback, Surviving the Future, which I know some of you have seen. Ooh, there you go. Um, which is a, a sort of, oh, well, they get everywhere, which is a sort of uh, read it front to back version. Um, I, I like to call it a gateway drug. To David's work, um, a sort of more accessible way in, if you like. Um, so I'll say a little bit about myself um, and a little bit about David. So I um, have been very involved with the Transition Towns movement from the outset. I wrote the second book of the Transition Movement, the Transition Timeline. Uh, also used to chair an organisation called the Ecological Land Cooperative, dealing with land access for um, ecological projects. Uh, I've also been quite involved with the gift economy movement. Um, the, a guy called Mark Boyle, known as the Moneyless Man, is one of my closest friends, and we've done a lot of work together. And I edited his Moneyless Manifesto. Um, and uh, and then yes, the last really three or four years have been devoted to getting David's work published and and getting it out into the world. David Fleming. Um, so all of these, this is going to be quite an interactive event. So all of these are elements that, if you want to, if you want to ask about, talk about, then we can do that. And my work as a whole goes under this banner of uh, dark optimism. Um, so my website's darkoptimism.org, and that's a uh, kind of approach that's unashamedly realistic about um, how far our world is from what we might want to create, but unashamedly positive about the kind of world we could create. Uh, and that sort of epitomizes my perspective across all of these different projects. Um, David Fleming uh, was born in 1940, died in 2010, um, lectured at CAT. He was involved with the origins of the Green Party in this country, worked very closely with his friend Jonathan Poet on that, particularly during the 70s and 80s. Um, was involved in the founding of the New Economics Foundation, uh, was one of the great inspirations behind the Transition Towns movement, which of course is now a, a big global thing. Um, I think in over 50 countries worldwide, and my friend Rob Hopkins, who um, was really the, the catalyst to transition, the founder really, he often says that his work in creating transition, he, he's rather humble when he says this, I think, but he often says that his work in creating transition was just taking David Holmgren on permaculture, Richard Fleming, uh, sorry, Richard Heinberg on peak oil and energy depletion, and David Fleming on community and resilience, putting them together and, and making it comprehensible and, and transition fell out. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, David was very influential on that. He was a former chair of the Soil Association, the um, organic agriculture advocates. And he indeed was one of the, the, the whistleblowers really on the um, energy crisis, peak oil type stuff, working with his friend Colin Campbell over in Ireland. Um, and by training, he was a historian and an economist. Um, but really, he was a uh, not a conventional economist in any sense of the word. In fact, Jonathan Poet told me that when uh, he was at Green Party or as an ecology party as it was then events in the 70s, David was urging his peers in the in the sort of fledgling ecology party to learn the language of economics because it's the economists who are always telling us that these things are unrealistic and impractical and we need to meet them on their own ground and engage with them. And so really his work was about... Um, trying to put right a lot of the mess that mainstream economics has, um, has put right. And um, so, as I mentioned, this event, I hope, is going to be quite an interactive event. Um, for those of you who've looked at David's work, you'll know that it's very much about um, bottom-up participation um, and conversation, and that being the, the, the basis um, for our future. So I'm hoping that that's something we can um, create some buzz around this event, get some interaction. So I'll start off by talking a bit about the books. I'll also introduce David in the form of some video and audio clips we have of him. Um, and really anything that you want to bring up or discuss, um, you can chat through the chat box as Greta has done there. Uh, also, if you've got any 
technical issues if you can't hear us or um, the video isn't working for you or something by all means mention that in the chat box and uh, we can try and try and sort it out at least um, and uh, test the interactivity here by um, sending out a quick initial poll um, so we'll see whether you receive this okay um, so this is just a quick test of who who we've got in the room and where you are in the world so you should be seeing a poll coming up on your screen and I can see some people are starting to answer it which is great um, yeah wonderful so in a moment I will end the voting and share the results with you all um, looks like almost everyone has voted now so I'm going to end the voting and it seems that as you should all now see um, we're mostly a UK group today I think we've got one maybe two people from North America a few people from wider Europe um, so it's good to know who's in the room and who we're who we're uh, who we're in the room with and what I'd like to do now is um, yeah play a little video clip from David Fleming because I think certainly for those of you who will be hearing how much familiarity some of you have with um, David Fleming's work but uh, but it's nice, I think, for those who are reading his work, whether you've already started reading his work or whether um, you're soon to start doing so, it's nice to have a sense of the kind of voice and personality of the person you're reading. Um, so if I can, I'm just going to queue up the um, video. Two seconds. Oh, it's funny, my thing has just disappeared. Okay, close survey. Right, sorry about that. I will now queue up the video. And just before David starts speaking, I'll just explain this was recorded in 2009, so a year before he died, in his, uh, his flat in Hampstead um, as part of a wider documentary. Um, and it's a three minute clip, so I'll hand over to David. I think we are in the, you know, the world we're looking at is completely different from the world that you know, we've been brought up to suppose is OK. That is to say, the world of the market economy, which depends on growth, um, which is not actually going to destroy the environment in any substantial way, and which has more than enough energy for the foreseeable future. We're no longer in that, in, in that paradigm. On the, on the other hand, as, as Thomas Kuhn pointed, um, point, pointed out, um, you know, one's not in a new paradigm till you're there. Uh, and there is a long period of, uh, of, of storm and stress um, during which people are becoming more and more uneasy about the paradigm that they're in and about the impossibilities and, uh, and, and anomalies that develop during, during that time. Um, and uh, there, is a, there, there is a time of great, great difficulty and, 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 and turbulence, like, like, like water um, you know, flowing from one pool to another down, down, down a waterfall. And I don't believe that we're yet in, our, in the next pool, so to speak. I don't yet think we are yet in a, a, new, in a, in a new paradigm. For a whole lot of reasons. One is, I mean, there are lots of reasons. One is we, you know, you know, as the people who, are sort of, who know about climate change recognise that you know, actually it is worse than is widely recognised. So there is a question about whether, whether that's soluble. There's certainly a question about whether the, whether the energy problem is, is, is soluble. Even if one goes down the optimistic route of building large um, solar arrays in the Sahara Desert and, and having cables around the rest of the world providing us with energy, you know, th there is a good deal of scepticism about, about whether technical fixes like that, like, like, like that would work. And above all, or maybe above all, um, there is the problem about economic growth itself. I mean, the market economy absolutely depends for its structural stability on economic growth. That's not because banks want a big, uh, and, and big money and big, yet, yet big paybacks. It's not because of bankers' bonuses, for nothing like that, for no trivial reason. It's just a system which is a fundamentally, um, a, 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 it, it's the fundamental nature of the system. We're living in a dynamic system, and dynamic systems are like bicycles. They only stay stable and upright so long as they're moving forward. There is no way the market economy can exist without growth. Um, and so uh, if, one, if growth were to stop, um, for a substantial amount of time, 
um, or still worse, if, if growth were actually to go into reverse and the market economy would collapse uh, and collapse, and I leave you to our imagination to imagine what that collapse would, what collapse would mean. So that if one is looking, which all, all of us should be looking for a, ta- looking for a time when, you know, for a, a non-growing economy, and we have to have an economy which isn't growing. Indeed, we have to have an economy which has shrunk a good deal, a long way from wh- where it is now. We have to have that. Unless we can do that, we're going to be in trouble. So we've had it either way, in a way. Um, if, so if, if, we, if, if we grow, if we, we, we're stuffed if we grow, and we're stuffed if we don't grow. And that means that we, we're not in a paradigm. It's very, very hard for anybody, anybody, hand on heart, to say, this is the way forward. It's going to be perfectly OK, um, people. Uh, we, we, have, we have a solution. And that is what Thomas Kuhn was talking about. He was talking about a, a comprehensive par- par- paradigm with some tweaks that needed to be developed. Um, but he wasn't talking about enormous question marks. And unfortunately, really, uh, instead of this alternative paradigm, all we can offer, really, is a most enormous planet-sized question. Needs to be developed, um, but he wasn't talking about enormous question marks. And unfortunately, really, uh, instead of this alternative paradigm, all we can offer really is a most enormous planet sized question marks. Thanks for the heads up on the microphone there, Tom. Um, so yes, that was uh, David Fleming, um, my late friend and mentor. Um, and uh, and I think that gives a sense of of the man and also gives a sense of um, the voice that you're hearing when you're when you're reading his work, which I think is always nice to have when possible. Um, and maybe also gives a sense of the um, the kind of helter skelter way in which his mind worked. I mean, I mean, I think actually that was a uh, relatively um, uh, kind of direct bit of speech, but his his talks were quite legendary for the fact that he had so many ideas that were so interconnected um, that he would often be sort of throwing out one idea and then linking it to another and throwing out another, and the audience would be desperately trying to to keep up. Um, and I think that's one thing that's really nice about the books is that it preserves his thinking in a form which um, which allows you to kind of read a bit and then stop and reflect on it and um you know take some time to digest it before moving on um but what's what's particularly nice about um sort of his full life work um lean logic the dictionary for the future and how to survive it is that um it conveys the holism of his thinking really the fact that um it's a sort of if you like a pre-invention of wikipedia because he he started writing it back in the 70s and um and so it's a dictionary but each entry in the dictionary and they range from economics to play to harmless lunatics to food to education to um paradoxes to art it it really is the most incredibly wide-ranging work but each of the entries when there's a word that has its own entry there's a little star next to it as it's sort of linking it together in a wikipedia style which allows you to um sort of follow the path of your interest like a choose your own adventure book if you like you uh, start wherever you want to start and you you follow the chain of interest and people are always telling me that they end up with this uh, uh, sort of bit of paper stuck in the book with a long list of entries that they want to follow up on they're like oh I want to finish reading this one first but then I want to get to that one then I want to get to that one and it's um, part of the reason I think for this very unconventional format is that as we'll see a bit later um, he was really trying to explore a, a completely different paradigm um, for how to organize society. Uh, and he was talking a bit in that clip about why we might need to do that, that, you know, particularly around economic growth, we're, we're in this terrible bind where, you know, if we, if we don't grow, as he says, market economies are like bicycles. If they don't keep moving forward, they fall over. Um, but on the other hand, if we do keep growing, as, as I'm sure this audience are well aware, we're crossing all sorts of um biophysical boundaries and and in many ways um yeah moving in a direction which will lead to an even more fundamental collapse possibly of of the biosphere 
Um, and so given, you know, this is when we know that we need a fundamental paradigm shift, when the only two options we can see both seem to lead to deeply undesirable answers. And, um, and I think that's why, in a way, why his talks were so helter-skelter, because um, when you're starting from a completely different paradigm and a different set of premises, it's hard to explain any one bit of it without explaining all the others. And so he'd be given, you know, half an hour to talk about about Carnival, for example, which is one of the key topics in his work. Um, and he'd basically try to say the entirety of this 300,000 word book by speaking extremely quickly. Um, and so uh, what's excited me about David's work and what is the reason why I've devoted so many years of my life to getting it out there is that um, this new paradigm, um, you know, there's no political party anywhere in the world which doesn't base, or mainstream political party anywhere in the world, which doesn't base its program for improving lives on economic growth. Um, and not only economic growth for a while, but economic growth indefinitely into the future, which, as people have said, is the, is the ideology of a cancer cell, ultimately. Um, and David's different paradigm, as we'll hear shortly, um, is not just you know, degrowth, which we're hearing more and more about these days. Um, because as he said, if we grow, we're screwed. If we don't grow, we're screwed. So where does that leave us? So both in, both growth and degrowth are looking at a metric which is fundamentally dangerous in a sense. Um, and his, the essence of his program was that instead of economic growth, we have culture, um, which, you know, can be a head scratcher when you first hear it. Um, but essentially, with his historian's hat on, he was saying that, if we look at the whole of human history and indeed prehistory, up until the last couple of hundred years, really, uh, the whole of our history was based in what he called the informal economy, as to contrast it with the formal monetary economy, um, what other people call the gift economy or even the core economy, um, because really it is the still to this day the basis of our lives. Um, it's still the informal economy which which raises children, which teaches language, which you know, supports people who've fallen through the cracks of the formal economy when they rely on their friends and family. Um, in so many ways, the informal economy remains the core economy, but nonetheless, it's been pushed back more and more over these last couple of hundred years of, of the sort of dominance of the growth-based market economy. Um, there are things now like, you know, comforting the grieving would obviously have been part of the informal economy and to some extent still is, but now it's completely accepted that you might pay someone to go to a counsellor or a psychotherapist in that situation and the idea of that as being a, a monetary transaction would have been horrific not that long in the past but now is seen as normal and that's another example of the market economy sort of pushing into spaces um, that were formerly the informal economy or giving someone a lift which is now you know seen as a monetary transaction where you might pay someone to drive you from here to there um, there are so many examples of that and what's really great about David's work is it it sets out in a very practical um, and very compelling terms, very readable terms, um, what it might look like to reclaim some of that sense of culture and community and conviviality, which which actually people desperately miss. Um, but it tends to be sort of promoted as a sense of this sort of quaint longing for the past and, you know, not really practical. You know, we've got to move with the times and all of that. Um, and David's work reminds us that it's not just some quaint longing, it's actually an absolute practical priority to rebuild these things because the market economy, as we'll hear, is is not um, not as strong and all-pervading and, and resilient as it likes to present itself as being. And there are real reasons to think that that formal economy is increasingly failing more and more people and will continue to fail more and more people. And so rebuilding the informal economy is, um, yeah, the path to a better future. And indeed, the ecology as well, which is the other key thing that humanity has always relied on, and of course, which is also becoming incredibly degraded and weakened during this um, this period. And the the key thing I would say before we hear a little bit more from David is um, the sense that actually the the, mark, the growth based market economy has been around just long enough that we all think it's normal because it's all that we've known and it's all that our parents have known, and it's all that our grandparents have known. Actually, it's incredibly abnormal. We're living in the weirdest time in history. Um, and so David's not saying, hey, I've had this brilliant idea of how we can make things better. What he's really saying is, 
now is incredibly unusual. We don't need to invent something incredible. We just need to remember what normal is and rediscover it. And I think in many ways, that's perhaps the core of, um, of what his work's about. And I'm just going to uh, play another clip from David now, which hopefully all of you will hear. And I'll, I'll post the direct link to the video down in the box in case anyone has trouble with hearing it or seeing it. Um, this is actually an interview that was done only, I think only about a month before he died, because um, he died very unexpectedly. He was in good health and he went to bed one night and didn't wake up. And um, in this clip, he's actually in a, <laughs> you'll see from the video, it looks like he's just sitting in a tree and he is in fact sitting in a tree um, because he was being interviewed by a young man called Henrik Dahle, uh, who did this project where for a year, every day he would climb a different tree. Um, and for the second half of the year, he started inviting people into the tree with him to interview him. Um, and uh, and so David was being interviewed by this young man in an oak tree on Hampstead Teeth. And in this clip, uh, Henrik is um, having having done no research on David, I believe, before the interview um, and having started talking to him. He's now uh, trying to, I think, get a sense of who on earth he's in a tree with. So I'll just play this clip for you. The title, you, you, you see yourself as a, an economist with an environmental or, a, I don't know, you're, you're interested in... I'm an environmental economist, you could argue. I'm a thinker, but the thing is I do... Uh, 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 my speciality is being a generalist. Uh, my speciality is of going out... Uh, it being, it, in the academic world, this is, this is called... It's an extremely long word. Your, 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 your tape recorder will probably crash. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, uh, um, interdisciplinary studies. That right. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I sort of try to. I sort of cover everything. There's almost nothing I don't sort of include in um, in in lean logic, which is why it's so, taking such a long time. So you're a holistic economist. Yes. Yes. Well, there's a lot of anthropological stuff actually, isn't there? Yes. In lean logic, so. Yeah, 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 and it, and, it, and it could be taken to the keenness, who knows? Because they're, they're so, having to cover such a wide, wide front, even with the even with the systems of Beth, it can be very difficult to to keep up with what's going on in all these things. And if I do keep up, every, I mean, the thing is, as I said, I get, I'm getting constant flack from friends and and, and people, you know, people so what, pointing me in the street and saying, "See that poor old fellow over there? <laughs> yeah, that one. He's got know, big ideas. Yeah, he's, he, he's been writing this. <laughs> he's been writing this book for the last twenty years. He'll never finish it. <laughs> and then they say. He's a nice fellow, but just don't mention the book. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And again, turn my mic off to uh, um, make sure I don't interrupt the video and then forget to turn it on again. Thanks for the note, Chris. Um, so yes, uh, David, as he said, was also quite known for um, not getting his bloody book published, as people would often put it. Um, and I think it was a partly his perfectionism um, in that he never felt it was ready. And as he said, it's covered such a wide range that he always felt everything needed updating. Um, but I, honestly, and he never said this to me, but in my opinion, I think he was a bit afraid of, of publishing it in the sense that he'd put his whole heart and soul into it for 30 odd years. Um, and the idea of it coming out and not making an impact, um, I think, would have sort of broken his heart, really. And um, I think there was part of part of that in it, too. Um, and there was a sort of interesting thing that he and I worked extremely closely together uh, for the last five years or so of his life on various things. But he never let me look at Lean Logic. Um, so he said that we were too close basically and the project was too close to his heart and if i if i was critical we'd fall out and he didn't want us to fall out um so it was only as it turned out i think about a month before his death that he said okay i think it's nearly ready now and um, would you like to at least read the sort of introduction um and i did and i thought it was fantastic and i said as much um and then when he died shortly after um because he didn't have close family i was involved with um going through his stuff in his house and getting the property sold and all this kind of thing. And I found the manuscript for Lean Logic on his computer. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I guess I'm allowed to read it now. And it was, um, I mean, he was the greatest conversationalist I ever met. And it was like an invitation to one more glorious rambling conversation with David. And it wasn't as polished as the version you can buy now, but it was, um, 
it was spectacular and it was very clear to me that you know i needed to see this published um but then i was talking to publishers and the feedback was wow you know this is amazing but it's really huge and it's in this unconventional link dictionary format and are people going to know how to grapple with it maybe we need some kind of um you know introductory version uh, and that's where i started work on on surviving the future several years ago um and pulled together this sort of basically i chose one of the pathways that you could take through lean logic um kind of focused on his his economic vision um and uh and yeah edited it together into a into a conventional read it front to back paperback um and when doing that actually surprisingly late in that process i realized i had a bit of a problem which was that uh, of course, a read it front to back paperback has an ending uh, and a dictionary does not have an ending. Um, and so I had to figure out um, how on earth I was going to end the book. Uh, and what I did in the end was, um, I mean, I did sort of discover a natural ending, but I also added an epilogue, which I edited together from a few different entries uh, in the dictionary. Um, and before we get to the more kind of interactive element of this um, webinar, I think a nice thing to do will be if I read you um, a section from that epilogue, which I think sums up uh, a lot of David's work. And also for those who haven't read his work, actually, I'm going to send another poll now, which is about um, how familiar those of you here are with David's work, whether you've uh, read lots of it or whether you've never heard of him before and just are curious and coming here for the first time to this webinar to find out what he's all about. Um, that will be useful to me to know as we go into more interactive work. Okay, so oh, it seems like quite a lot of people are not familiar with his work. Okay, good to know. Uh -huh. Ah, because the last webinar I ran on his work was with Local Futures, and the majority there were quite familiar. So, yeah, so we've got a few, we've got a couple who are really big fans, but most of you are not not that familiar. Okay, I'll uh, just share those results with you all. Um, so yeah, for those of you who aren't familiar, which is most of you, I think this will be a nice sense, along with hearing um, those clips, um, of where he's coming from. Uh, so this is, yeah, a little extract from the, the epilogue to the paperback. Um, the great transformation has already happened. It was the revolution in politics, economics, and society that came with the market economy and which hit its stride in Britain in the late 18th century. Most of human history had been bred, fed, and watered by another sort of economy, but the market has replaced, as far as possible, the social capital of reciprocal obligation, loyalties, authority structures, culture, and traditions with exchange, price, and the impersonal principles of economics. Unfortunately, the critics of economics have had a tendency to discuss the whole structure as a tissue of misconceptions. It is a critique that fails. The strength of economics is its considerable, if far from complete, understanding of the flows and comparative advantages that underlie trade, jobs, capital and incomes, and the logic of optimizing behavior, all backed by glittering accomplishments in mathematics. That makes it a powerful analytical instrument so that just a few misconceptions, such as a failure to understand the informal economy or resource depletion, can have leverage. Like a baby monkey at the controls of a Ferrari, they can turn it into an instrument with extraordinarily destructive potential. If it were a tissue of errors, it would not be dangerous. It is its 90% brilliance which makes it so. Indeed. The government's main task in a mature market economy is to keep it free of obstacles that might stop it growing, like a bemused farmer would treat the enchanted goose. Keep the foxes out so that it can go on magically laying its golden eggs. The market's achievements and answers sound authoritative and final, but what is truly most significant about them is how naive they are. If the flow of income fails, the powerfully bonding combination of money and self-interest will no longer be available on its present all-embracing scale, and perhaps not at all. And it must inevitably fail, as the market's taught competitiveness demands ever-increasing productivity, and thus relies on the impossibility of perpetual growth. In the meantime, 
the reduction of a society and culture to dependence on mathematical abstraction has infantilized a grown-up civilization and is well on the way to destroying it. Civilizations self-destruct anyway, but it is reasonable to ask whether they have done so before with such enthusiasm. And in obedience to such an acutely absurd superstition, all while claiming with such insistence that they were beyond being seduced by the irrational promises of religion. Every civilization has had its irrational but reassuring myth. Previous civilizations have used their culture to sing about it and tell stories about it. Ours has used its mathematics to prove it. Yet, when this relatively short lived market society is gone, we will miss its essential simplicity, its price mechanism, its self stabilizing properties, its impersonal exchange, the comforts it delivers to many, and the freedoms it underwrites. Its failure will be destructive. And the end is in sight. During the early decades of the century, the market will lose its magic. It is the aim of lean logic to suggest some principles for repairing or replacing the atrophied social structures on which most human cultures were built as the basis for a cohesive society that might survive the turbulent times to come. Um, so yeah, for those of you who aren't familiar with his work, that gives you a taste of both his writing um, and his style of writing and, uh, and I think where he's coming from. Um, and I really would encourage any of you who are, um, you know, want to say why you've come to this webinar, what brought you here, or topics you'd like to hear more about, or those of you who know Fleming's work, if there's any element that you'd like to um, talk about or hear more about, um, then please do contribute in the chat box and we can try and, uh, yeah, take this in the direction that's most useful and interesting for you all. Um, Meantime, I will. <laughs> meantime, I will uh, just mention the reception that the books have had to date. So both the books were published simultaneously around a year ago, um, and uh, they have won several awards. They won um, actually just last week. Won Lean Logic won first prize in the New York Book Show, um, and a few months ago won first prize in the New England Book Show, and in the um, the PubMed. Um, National Publishing Award. Um, Kate Rayworth, who you may be familiar with, recently published Donut Economics, named Lean Logic as her book of the year last year. Um, and there's a film now being made about David's work called The Seed Beneath the Snow, um, which when I have a moment, I will I will share the link to the trailers for that because that's coming out in the summer. Um, and I led a course at Schumacher College earlier this year um, on his work, which is another place where he lectured. Um, so we. Uh, Stephen Barrett is saying in the comments, this reminds him of David Cameron's Big Society, which um, is interesting because David, uh, David Fleming actually references that in uh, in Lean Logic. Um, and he thought that um, it had potential. He thought that, you know, potentially this was the Conservatives actually, um, you know, grasping some of the uh, essential nature of what's needed. And, and unfortunately, in his opinion, doing it um in the wrong way and that they saw it somewhat as a um something that could be organized from the center rather than organized from the bottom up which is something he writes a lot about in lean logic um but he did see um that the big society could be potentially an avenue to some good things happening um and was generally uh yeah generally a fan of it but as you as you say i think very often what happened with the big society was yeah it was just an excuse to for centralized bodies to say, well, we're not going to pay for this stuff anymore. Um, so you do it. <laughs> and wouldn't that be great? Because it's all community. Um, and I think what's really interesting about that is that often um, I've actually seen critique of community groups that have stepped up in the in the wake of you know austerity, which has ramped up massively um, since the big society was floated. Um, there's often been criticism, you know, if you step in and do this, then you know the authorities aren't going to provide it anymore. Um, and I think both David and I would feel that that is an inappropriate response that actually in these times where the economy, the, the mainstream economy is fundamentally unsustainable, actually we need to learn um, mutual aid again. We need to learn to support ourselves again and not just ask the centralized bodies to pay for it and, you know, come back and, and, and sort it out for us. 
Um, but actually learning to support ourselves is a sensible thing, given that um, austerity may not simply be bad policy and a choice. It may also be a recognition to some extent of um, the more straightened struggles that the economy is having. Um, and uh, Andy Ross is asking, um, bearing in mind the urgency of these issues, why didn't David see the urgency of publishing the book? I think you can all see this, but I'm just repeating it in case anyone can't see the chat box. Um, and the answer is he absolutely did. Um, he he would um, he was constantly berating himself for not getting it out, um, and he worked relentlessly on it. Um, Rob Hopkins tells the story of David turning up to Rob's wedding, um, still carrying the manuscript for Lean Logic and scribbling away at it. Um, uh, he came to my thirtieth birthday, um, you know, and sat in a blissful reverie in, in the park editing Lean Logic. Um, he worked relentlessly at it um, and was desperately keen to reach the stage where he could um, you know be going around he saw it not as the um, the final word on any topic but as hopefully asking some of the right questions and encouraging some of the right conversations one of my favorite lines from his work is do nothing that matters without consulting a conversation and uh, and so um, so yeah he felt very strongly the urgency I remember when um, um wheat rust was sweeping through russia i think it was around 2008 9 um and he was horrified to see that because that was something that he'd warned about and written about in um in the agriculture section of lean logic and yeah he uh he badly felt the urgency but never quite seemed to get to the point where it was ready for publication and as i say i've speculated a little about why that might be i think the other aspect was that he was so fascinated by everyone he met um which is something that a lot of people remember about him, that he tended to talk to someone and they would give him some ideas and he'd say, oh my God, I have to rewrite the relevant section of the book. And he meant it, you know, he was genuinely um, incredibly receptive to um, people who had experiences and uh, expertise that he didn't. Um, and yeah, also the question, what do I think David would make of progress or lack of it since 2010? Um, I might actually play another clip from David, which I think speaks a little bit to that um obviously not directly since he died in 2010 but um yeah i'll just queue up this other one if i can just remind myself which one it was there we go sorry two seconds clicked on the wrong thing here we go And we tend to think whenever, if we, if we talk to to most people about this, they would say, "Come on, pull pull the other one. This is not this is not realistic." But actually, we also need to recognise how crucially important the the informal economy already is now. And most of the thing what we're doing right now is in the informal economy. We're not getting not not, not getting paid for this. Um, our family life is informal. All our friends are part of the informal economy. And most of the things with people in our that kind of light life do a part of the informal economy. We do things for each other constantly, all the time. Uh, and uh, if I were to do something, if I was to do something for a friend and they were to offer to pay me, I would be mortally insulted. That'd be more or less the end of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> think if you didn't think, oh, come off, come off in the informal economy. This is terribly romantic, uh, unrealistic. On the, on the on the contrary, it's a very unrealistic to dismiss the important the informal economy as being as being unimportant. So it's going to be a, 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 a big rediscovery of the, inf the the informal economy, which is very hard very hard to summarise. <laughs> but how does it? Okay, the, you're doing a lot of research about how things have worked and how th and you've obviously got ideas about how things could work. But you know we've got this whole financial system. Are you you're talking about replacing that with something else? No, unfortunately, I'm not. I don't think it's going to last. I mean, I think a lot. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm, I'm a bit of a, sort of a, a right winger to, to most people's horror, horror and shock. And so I think, in many ways, the system, <laughs> the system we've got at the moment is really is not a bad system. I think capitalism is a, is a good thing. The only problem with capitalism is that it destroys the planet, you know, um, and that right. it's, it's based on growth. I mean, apart from those two little details, it's got a lot to be said in its favour. Yeah. And when capitalism dies, you know, we'll be on our knees. We'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll wish it was back because it's, um, it supports a, a high standard of living. It supports freedoms. 
grain from the point of view of freedom, an incredibly free society, and mm. that is basically to do, do with the, the, the capitalist system we've got. So it's mm. a wonderful system in, in a way. It's very efficient. It's based on pull. It's not based on authoritarian people telling other people what to do on the whole. It's based on people in, uh, ask, asking for services and, and paying for them. So in many ways, it's got a lot to be said in its favour, but it's got the absolute, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. It's got these absolutely crucial flaws, um, which is, well, the, the essential flaw is it depends on growth. Um, and um, and uh, and it will go on. It will go on depending on growth to the point at, at which it at which at which it collapses. Uh, it's not necessarily an argument against a system that it collapses because most systems do collapse in the end. I mean that's a part of the nature of the wheel of life. You know, systems do collapse, and there is life and death. So I think I, I, I'm to some extent slightly inclined to forgive capitalism for for uh, being about to collapse. I mean, there are lots of fine things, you know, lots of love affairs and, which have, have come to a sticky end, and lots of novels which come to an end, and life tends to come to an end. I mean, life itself comes to an end. You can't necessarily blame life for being something that comes to an end. So I'm not really going to blame capitalism. On the other hand, it does. I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's quite, quite a thing to be held, that, you know, quite, quite an accusation. You know, hard, hard for it to live down, the accusation that not only is it... Um, is it is it um, based on, on the ludicrous idea that growth can continue indefinitely, but it's going to destroy the entire planet with it. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a lot. That, that's, that, a that, that's, a, that's a big, big problem. It's, a big, it's, not, it's not a small problem. It's a sort of, <laughs> fairly sort of fundamental <laughs> pro problem. But anyway, the thing is, so the thing is as, uh, as, uh, as um, it is uh, going to um, hit the buffers in, in, in this way, we don't have to you know, go around uh, destroying things. We don't have to dismantle the banking system and such things. But whatever we do with the banking system, it will make absolutely no difference at all. We do not have to change, reform things. I'm not a reformer. I don't think we should bother. Uh, we should, we should uh, waste time reforming things. It's going to reform itself in that it's going to come to um, um, uh, falling about our ears very, very quickly indeed. And indeed, the longer we system, keep the system going, in some ways, you could argue, the longer we keep the system going, uh, the, 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 the longer the growth will continue and the greater will be the fall when it eventually happens. The more nuclear power stations we'll be able, we'll be able to build, build, build. Uh, the more forests we'll be able to cut down, the greater the CO2 uh, accumulations when eventually the crash happens. Um, so there is something to be said, actually, for, uh, for the crash being earlier rather than later. So, yeah, a bit more from David in which he touches on the sense of um yeah where we might go from here and, and and what what he might have made of how things are progressing which i'll say more about but i just want to put out another quick poll here to again get a sense of who's in the room um and this is a question about how optimistic you personally feel about the future of the world or society and uh, if you feel like the question's misframed or the answers aren't quite um capturing what you feel about it then by all means um put it put, put a better question or put put not put your answer in the chat box uh instead or as well um so while you're uh <laughs> contemplating that um i think in some ways and this ties in with this thing about the big society and austerity uh, and what i was saying earlier i think in some ways um David would be encouraged by um, a lot of the things that are happening in sort of networks that I move in, a lot of the um, bottom-up informal um, organizing and um, mutual support that goes on underneath the headlines, as it were. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you only understand what's happening in the world through mainstream media, then it's very easy to get very depressed. Um, but if you're actually hanging out with people who are doing amazing, inspiring things on the ground, then it's hard not to have your heart warmed by that and see that um, for all the bleakness that I see at the um, overall kind of policy level. <laughs> so I'm just laughing because I, uh, I saw that I think one person had put somewhat positive on the poll. Um, and that was the only person who put somewhat positive and then they retracted it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there's a limited number of people, as you can see, who are feeling positive about the state of the world right now. So clearly it's not just me. Um, but yeah, I, and I think one thing that's um, to come on to the question that Ruthie Brandt, my friend Ruthie Brandt, is asking in the chat box there about uh, the kind of conversations um, that people are having after reading the books. Um, I think one thing that's really inspiring about David's work, and indeed that helped to sort of launch the transition movement, is that it presents an alternative to um, 
to the two things that we're always told to do in response to a world that we all feel um, is not going in the best of all possible directions. And um, the, the two things we're always told to do, of course, are you know, lobby your political representatives and um, change your lifestyle. And I think they're actually both can be quite depressing um, because, you know, we lobby our political representatives and they ignore us um, or they're, you know, overpowered by corporate interests quite often that have more to do with whether they get reelected than, than our opinions do. And so that can be quite disheartening. And personal lifestyle change can be quite disheartening, too, because you, you change your life. And if what you're hoping to see is a, is a transformed world from doing that, well, it can be quite miserable to watch the whole world charging in the opposite direction and feel like you're you're a drop in the ocean. Um, and so what David's work holds out and what transition is is about implementing to a large extent is the alternative of um, operating on a different scale. Um, so if the if the personal work feels like it's too small scale to make a difference and the political scale feels like it's too large scale to influence in any meaningful way. Um, one of the not necessarily one of the most poetic, but I think one of the most brilliant lines in David's work is large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within a large scale framework. And for me personally, that transformed my approach. When I met David in 2006, when he taught me at Schumacher College, um, I was particularly focused on climate change and I was thinking, oh, well, I need to go and get involved with the UN and, you know, try and change the framework conventional climate change level stuff that's going on around that and the negotiations. And when I heard that line from David, it really made me reevaluate that and realize that, you know, actually all the emissions are coming from the local level in a sense, um, in that everywhere is everywhere is local for where it is. Um, and that we absolutely need structural change, but the kinds of solutions we need are local. It's local people who know what they need and what their resources are and what the availability of those resources is um, and what skills they have. Um, and so all of my work, I think, over the last 10 years has focused on putting into place those frameworks. So transition is a framework for small scale local action to ramp up into a wave of empowered action. If you like, those those, those drops in the ocean become a, a, a tidal wave of action. Um, the Ecological Land Cooperative is a framework for allowing, you know, there are an awful lot of good people who just want to manage land responsibly. Um, you know, as, as one um, farmer quoted in Tol Colin Tudge's book said, um, I don't want to compete with anyone. I just want to farm well. And I thought that, you know, that was such a radical concept in our age, the idea that, you know, farming isn't about competing in the market. It's, it's about caring for a piece of land and producing good food. And that's somehow been lost in this age of, of, of mechanization and depopulation of the country. Um, and so the land co-op is about finding those people who want to farm well um, and helping them access land despite all the sort of institutional and structural barriers that are in place. And indeed, David Fleming himself is um, one of the things he's best known for is inventing the idea of carbon rationing. Um, and he devised a scheme as to how that could be put into place at the national level called TEX, um, which was studied very seriously by the British government. They did a feasibility study on it um, in 2008, which David and I consulted to. Um, and I think ultimately decided against it because they realized it would be a challenge to economic growth and you know, far better to um, destroy a benevolent climate than to challenge economic growth, of course, in the opinion of um, the powers that be at the moment. But all of his work and all of my work really has been about that operating at scale. So often a, a, a town or community scale where it's small enough that your voice has a real influence and you can really see that you're making a difference. But it's large enough that you can achieve significant empowering things together and see that the power that you have. And very often the institutions at that level are actually sitting around trying to figure out how to engage with people. So when you bang on their door and say we want to change things, um, very often you're banging on an open door. Uh, and I won't get into it now, but a really interesting project um, called Flatpak Democracy uh, is happening in the town of Froome here in England, um, where they have um, set up a group of independent candidates, but um, sort of campaigning as a group called Independents for Froome. And um, 
and they've actually run a clean sweep. They've thrown all the political parties out of local government in Froome and now control the three million budget for local council and that grew out of their local transition group originally. Um, so I think that scale is a really powerful scale for action, which which isn't disheartening and miserable. Um, and so to come back to Ruthie's question, very often I think those are the kind of um, conversations that are coming out of David's work is, you know, how do we act at a scale that's that's meaningful um, and that provides us with the support that the global economy, you know, more and more people increasingly are not being supported by the global economy in the way that, you know, maybe they used to be, whether that's through um, whether that's through austerity or whether that's through rising prices, pricing people out of the market. Um, so, uh, so yeah, hold on, I'm just going to read the next question here. Well, the duration. Uh -huh. um, I think actually I might have a, um, yeah, I've got a, a, a quick, another in response to your question, Fionn. Um, another not direct response but i think I'll, I'll tie it in obviously when uh, i've got limited clips of david so i don't have a video of him saying everything exactly um but yeah in terms of david's take on economics and on growth um this is a lovely little short one minute clip um, that i think sums up his his new paradigm that i was saying earlier One of the first things we ought to do about it, if we're really going to understand economics is forget economics altogether. But we oughtn't to be thinking about economics. We ought to think be thinking about people, thinking about thinking about um, well, yes, our relationships and and uh, and 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 not even think about our relationships. Well, if people are going to think about my relationship. I have a good relationship with Beth, with Beth on the whole, apart from when she disagrees with me, which she doesn't do it all. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't spend. I should be rooting. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about our relationship. We just do it. We just get on with life, you know. And I think the best relationship about that. And I think the, I, the, the, the book, book is all really about getting on with life and crucially getting on in, in, in life in the things that really matter. And what, what really matters is music. And, music. Yeah. And, 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 and humour and, and, and com conversation and um, painting and the, the arts and, yeah. and um, things like that and, 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 and having fun, play. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and farting about and generally enjoying life that's what really really matters Every, everything else is just an, almost sort of a, just a, a kind of, sort of oh just sort of the, the, uh, well sort of the, the needle hiss as we used to say in the old days of gramophone records uh, you probably are too young to know that that expression anyway needle hiss yeah I know, I know needle hiss <laughs> that is it it's sort of just at the foundation uh, the re most of the rest of life is just the foundation on which what really matters is going to be built and what really matters uh, is, is culture and play and music and those, those are things OK, so I will bring this around to your question, Fionn. Um, I'm just going to put out another quick poll now, which is similarly about your optimism for the future, um, but bringing it down to the um, personal level. Ah, yes, sorry, I forgot to post the direct links to those, didn't I? Um, While well, you answer the polls for a minute, and I will just pull up these um, links that people are asking for. Okay, so this is the um, this is the one that we just played, and the previous one um, was about the informal economy and capitalism, and the link to that one. is there um okay so this is a very interesting poll so um despite the general air of gloom about the state of the wider world people are feeling substantially more positive and optimistic about their their personal or local future and i've asked i've been asking this question um to quite a few groups and that seems to be the general pattern um and we've had some quite interesting conversations about whether that's 
uh, just a sort of denial <laughs> that um, that you know the world is really bleak, but I refuse to believe that um, it's going to affect my family or my life, um, or whether it's because the kinds of people who are joining these conversations are actually um, taking appropriate steps to um, prepare for the less than positive um, broader picture that we're moving into. I mean, one of the one of the key um, concepts in David's work and indeed in transition that built on that is uh, resilience um, and I think resilience is a widely misunderstood, misunderstood um, concept I think people tend to think that resilience is about uh, sort of predicting how the future is going to be and then um, being ready for it um, but that really isn't resilience um, resilience is much more about um, choosing to act in a way which makes sense in the widest possible range of possible futures, um, accepting that our predictions about the future are inevitably going to be wrong to some extent. Um, so how do we act in ways that make sense in that? So on a personal level, um, you know, we've, start, we've had some questions that are starting to ask about um, collapse, um, the potential, you know, when, when, when growth can't continue and the, the growth-based economy falls over, um, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, should we be trying to hasten that? Should we be trying to prepare for that? Um, and for me personally, the only work that's made sense for me over the last decade or so has been work which, um, you know, if there were to be some great cultural turning towards sanity, um, you know, suddenly the world was going to realise, ah, you know, we do quite want a livable climate actually, and you know, maybe we should be preparing for some of these things. Maybe we don't want to be fermenting the sixth great mass extinction in the history of the planet and destroying the web of life which produces all our food and water and oxygen so if if that um if that great cultural turning were to happen i would want to feel like well my work has has helped that you know has supported that has has helped to um to nourish that and even bring it about um but also um, given that that isn't what I predict will happen, that's what I hope will happen, that's what I'm shooting for, but it isn't what I predict, what I, what I predict is far darker than that. Um, and so I couldn't wholeheartedly do work which was predicated on the assumption of that great turning to sanity. Um, for me, the only work that really feels wholeheartedly like it makes sense is work that would help that great turning to happen, but would also be helpful in the context of um, sort of a continuation of the path that we're on now. Um, and that for me again is something that's really appealing about David's work is that you know even as things are now we would be a lot happier and a lot healthier and a lot less lonely if we lived a life that was much more built on that music and culture and community that he was talking about in that last clip um, but also um, if we continue down this path towards um, collapse David talks a lot about what that means in the book but if we continue down that path towards collapse then it also makes sense because ecology and the informal economy are if you like the only safety net we have um, when the market economy is is no longer available on its present scale or indeed at all um, it's those things that we're going to be relying on and so rebuilding and strengthening them now makes absolute sense in that context and um, so uh, Derebu is just asking me to repeat my definition of resilience so I was saying that um, a lot of people think resilience is predicting the future and preparing for it. I would argue that resilience is acting in a way that makes sense across the widest possible range of possible futures. Um, obviously, some futures are not possible. You know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel that I need to prepare for a future in which climate denialists prove to be correct, um, because I've looked into that deeply myself, and I'm fully confident that um, you know the climate science consensus is unfortunately accurate um so you know the widest possible range of possible futures doesn't mean preparing for impossible futures i would also describe personally the kind of techno utopia singularity star trek you know our future is out there among the stars i don't consider that a plausible future it seems to me that um you know given the scale of the efforts to identify another remotely earth-like world that might possibly harbor life um, we'd do better to focus on the one that we actually live on and also um, you know if you consider how difficult it might be to build a city in the middle of the Sahara Desert under the relentless scorching sun with incredibly rare and incredibly heavy rainfall 
um you know that's a thousand times easier than starting a colony on another planet and yet nobody's remotely thinking that that's feasible so for me that is um not a feasible a future that i need to take into account in my resilience work but again yeah resilience for me is acting in a way that makes sense across the widest possible range of possible futures um okay i'm just catching up on some of your comments here which is great i'm really loving to see some some interaction going on um yeah interesting point from andy about you know we heard earlier that most of us here are um from somewhere in the uk um and whether with regard to climate change the uk is well probably is already getting off a lot more likely than the rest of the world given that the world health organization say climate change is already killing hundreds of thousands of people a year um you know maybe that personal optimism is about being in a place that might get off relatively lightly um although arguably i would say um the uk and its role as uh you know follower of america in many respects um what's happening in america tends to happen here shortly afterwards in in many respects not all um i would say that we probably also are one of the world leaders in destroying our informal economy um i think a lot of the world um still knows how to rely on each other rather than relying on money um we have this very powerful cultural myth of the idea of uh financial independence as being this really um desirable honorable respectable thing you know you you should strive to be financially independent if you're a responsible person in our society that's a very powerful story um i would argue it's a complete myth i don't think there's any such thing as financial independence i think um being rich doesn't make you in any sense independent because someone else is still growing your food and building your house and supplying your utilities and all of that stuff um all that having lots of money allows you to do is be dependent on people you don't know instead of on people you do know um so you know whereas um you know in a you know let's say a sort of stereotypical um village scenario where you you know you know the guy who grows your food and if you fall out with him then you know you're not going to get any food so you you need each other and that's you know a basis on which to repair and replenish that relationship and and build those ties of relationship even with people that maybe you don't get on with that easily if you're rich and you buy your food in the supermarket and you fall out with you know the guy who runs the supermarket well you can just go to another one um but i think that sense of um I think it's one of the problems actually that the transition movement has faced is that um very often the people attending don't have an experience not always but often those people don't have much experience of what it is to truly live in community and not you know and to rely on each other rather than relying on money um and so often it becomes well let's get together every tuesday at seven o'clock and do community um and of course that doesn't doesn't really work because you know if you fall out with the guy who runs the transition group well you just don't go again um and that's a very different thing i think the only times when community really builds in a meaningful sense is when people rely on each other and very often that's when the financial economy has failed when nobody can get a job whatever that looks like locally um and then people really learn to rely on each other so yeah just to say in terms of andy's comment that i think there's a lot of the world where people um it will be a lot less of a shock for people when the market economy disappears for them because they still remember what it is to live independence on each other and on nature directly um and so in some ways you know in that sense um the uk and the uh the quote developed world or the minority world as i tend to call it um could often be in a worse place because we're um we're so used to the uh the comfort of the market economy being available um but absolutely as greta says you know in some people's case it's because they're you know they're already living a life of, of the kind that david is is absolutely advocating um you know a couple of weeks ago i did a webinar with a bunch of people from the global eco village network um and they also felt greatly more optimistic about their community um futures pleasure lydia and um uh oh i lost my there. uh give me two seconds well, yeah, so this sense of um, of a community future is, of course, in itself a controversial framing in, in the question that I asked. Um, in the sense, I think, you know, I've heard from people, 
from the sort of 60s and 70s back to the land movement and hippie who was talking you know they were talking then about how mad the mainstream was and how destructive it was but the beautiful thing being that if you just sort of dropped out stepped aside well it just sort of bowed on and didn't even notice you and you could you know live in this little enclave that, that made sense um and of course the problem now is that the 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 system if you like has grown so big and so um overwhelming that it's you know causing global scale problems like climate change for example like ecosystem collapse um and of course those problems are so big that there isn't anywhere in the world that's not going to be affected by those things and so that i think for me anyway that calls me to not just um retreat into a way of life that makes sense but to well, i'll be doing things like getting these books published and having these kind of conversations with you about how we um how we can maybe shift some of the cultural stories the narratives that shape um what we think of as important um and the way that our the way that our society develops i mean that was certainly my experience with the um the carbon rationing idea that david came up with and at that point i got kind of involved in politics and policy and was trying to see that through um and then essentially saw how this idea of challenging growth was still completely politically unthinkable um and sort of realized that um <laughs> when people talk about being realistic um it's very important to ask them what reality they're referring to um i think there's a huge divide at the moment between um for example climate scientists are saying look realistically we need to reduce emissions by say 10 percent a year in a country like the uk if we're going to have a stable climate you know that's physical reality and they're being realistic um the politicians they're speaking to yeah. sort of burst out laughing that's nothing like realistic you know maybe we can do two or three percent realistically but they're talking about political reality and they're right in terms of political reality but ultimately these two realities are going to have to be reconciled um and you at the moment you've got two sets of realists sort of lobbing rocks at each other um or indeed trying to collaborate um but realizing that they're actually dealing with two very different realities and of course if we don't reconcile them um in some kind of political way um only one of those is going to pull rank you know physical reality doesn't negotiate when it comes down to it so if we if we aren't able to reconcile those realities then um you know i think in terms of climate change people often talk about um do we go down the mitigation route or an adaptation route i would argue there's a third route which is the one we're currently taking which is the route of suffering like at the moment we're saying well we won't really mitigate we won't really ad adapt we'll just put all our all our eggs in the basket of suffering um and that unfortunately seems to be um the mainstream response right now and so um uh so yeah just you know just coming back to this idea that we're feeling more positive because our particular communities are you know are preparing and are in a good place um for me personally there is that question about you know how do we also contribute to the wider story and that might well be by showing a great example of how much better life is and i think that's um in many ways for me the fundamental problem that environmentalism has had um over recent decades probably um is that it's tended to be seen as a very you should do this you shouldn't do that kind of a message you know if you do that you will reap the consequences and you know you must not um and that's a really uncompelling message i think um to be to be offering and i think a far more compelling message is available um i mean i was i was talking to people the other day about flying and i swore off flying 15 years ago because of the environmental impacts but i don't see that as giving up flying i think that's a terrible framing for it i see that as deciding to embrace a life wholehearted you know for me as i learned about the consequence of that i felt more and more miserable at the prospect of flying i thought my god i know how just devastating this is I, I i don't want to do it anymore um and so learning how to build a life which um didn't involve that which involved a lot more local activism that involved traveling by slower means of and more expensive means of transport when i did travel a long way it's made me a lot happier you know it's got rid of that cognitive dissonance and it's brought me to a way of life that i can you know tell a story with my life that i'm proud to tell and i think in many ways that's what life is for um and that to me is a far more inspiring message hey why don't you give up a life of cognitive distance why don't you give up a life where you don't believe in what you're doing and instead live a life that's wholehearted and joyous it's a far better message than you shouldn't fly or you're a bad person i think um 
and so yeah i think if we can tell stories about our communities our our um our projects and places like cat which are providing compelling examples of a better way of life and also living wholeheartedly joyous lives well you know why wouldn't people living in a society with higher rates of mental health disorders and suicide and everything want that message um so how well are the books selling and he's asking um especially with regard to library schools and other places um so they've sold about just coming up for ten thousand copies now um in total uh, i'm just about to record the audio book next month um and indeed a, a one of the students who was on my schumacher college course around the work back in february has volunteered to produce a, a sort of wikipedia version an online version of lean logic um because it, the format massively um lends itself to that uh and so um he is uh is currently working on that it's not available yet but he's he's working on that um and also i had the um rather unexpected um uh experience of um a uh american billionaire um getting in touch uh and saying he'd read an article i'd written on a website called open democracy and then he went and bought the books and he read them and they are the books he's been waiting for for 15 years and how could he possibly support um what we're doing um and i was a bit wary at first because i'm generally not a big fan of philanthropy but it turned out he isn't either <laughs> he describes it as a as the charitable industrial complex um and um and in fact he is so one of the things we decided to do was that he's funding the um gifting of copies of the books in a very appropriate informal economy way to um to audiences that might be receptive so i believe tom um has spoken to you all about the possibility of receiving a free copy of surviving the future and um you're very welcome to one, and that's been funded by this uh, by this billionaire who got in touch to say that he was blown away by the books and wanted to support them. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I would say that word is still massively spreading. I mean, the fact that, as I say, last week it won first place in the New York um, New York uh, Book Show, um, and they're um, yeah continuing to build and continuing to spread. I think um, libraries, I believe. About 200 libraries have taken copies so far, um, which is obviously great because that allows people to access the books without needing to access money from the formal market economy to do so. Um, yeah. Oh, and just I noticed Tom posted a comment about resilience. Um, so, yeah, I um, if you're really interested to get into um, a detailed discussion of resilience, um, the entry in Lean Logic on resilience is one of the most astonishing entries actually it really um uh gets into um yeah resilience in a way that um a lot of people who do a lot of work on resilience have been deeply impressed by uh, and as tom says you and as lean logic says you can define it in ways such as uh, the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to still retain essentially the same function structure identity and feedback uh, but as david says there is nothing wrong with that, except that it can still leave you wondering what resilience is really about. So here is another way of coming at it. Um, and it's, um, yeah, I won't get into it now, but I, for those of you who are interested in, in systems thinking and resilience thinking, I massively recommend that as some seriously insightful um, work on the nature of, of resilience, um, which I think David made a, a, a unique contribution to. Sorry, I've just realized I didn't share the results of that poll about personal futures. I just mentioned that they were a lot more positive so here they are um for you all um so i'm just going to play another quick clip from david which will give me an excuse to take a moment to um read a few more of your comments and probably in about five or ten minutes i'll start wrapping things up so if you've got a burning thing that you want to say speak now or forever hold your peace um and let me just queue up uh david again Again, from his um, from his oak tree interview. The government is still thinking about incentive schemes right. uh, because they say that your people <coughs> they they, 
people will that won't actually do anything unless they're, they're treated like donkeys, you know, with the carrot and the stick. Well, actually, we've got we, we're not donkeys, and if and we're treated like donkeys, then we'll behave like donkeys. If if we're, if we're trusted, you know, to do something, you know, which is actually which works, mm-hmm. that is, say, if we want to do, then the thing is completely different. And lean logic is, to a very large extent, based on that. It's it's saying actually, it it's treating human beings with respect to the people having mm. imagination, to use your word, and intelligence and judgment and mm. motivation. And what we're doing is unleashing, the great unleashing that I'm interested in is unleashing the imagination mm. um, uh, of, of, of people so they can get on and build their own future, which I think is, I think a lot of people are prepared, are prepared to do. And the transition movement is an indication of how prepared they are. Yeah, so uh, so that was David again speaking about the the importance of imagination, which is something I know Rob Hopkins has been particularly inspired by lately, um, reading as since getting these books published. So Rob was reading drafts of these books sort of ten, fifteen years ago, um, but since getting them published, Rob's been rereading them, and and I know imagination is one of the key themes in David's work that's really stood out for him, and that he's currently exploring, um, and this ties in with. Some of the comments that are coming through from Stephen and Alice now, um, this idea that uh, there's a there's a line that does the rounds. I can't think who said it originally, but that the the greatest problem that we face in the world today is that we lack the imagination to conceive of how it could be. Um, Unger, I think, might have said it. So I'm sure I'm misquoting slightly, um, and uh, and that I think is a huge problem that that a lot of people um, still buy the you know there is no alternative mantra um and so yeah talking about um advertising and marketing i mean i don't think i've got the answer to this question this is something you know i talk about with my friends and and you know we grapple with back and forth um you know how do we where do we find the balance between so as i mentioned earlier one of my best friends is is mark boyle who uh, writes for the guardian about the fact that he's now given up electricity altogether and is trying to create a completely um, localized gift economy permaculture um, way of life in um, in Galway in Ireland um, and that's something we sort of designed together um, and that's the way of life which for him feels truly nourishing and um, tells the story he wants to tell with his life um, but then again there's this question well don't we need to tell other people about it otherwise it just becomes overwhelmed by by forces beyond our control and so that's why he accepted this column with the guardian it's quite amusing in a way that he um because he doesn't use electricity so he has to write his articles by pencil and paper post them to the guardian who then type them up and put them on their website and then when people comment on the articles they select some of the comments um write them on a into a letter and post them back to, to Mark. So he doesn't even know when his articles go out on the web, but you know, and he has mixed feelings about it. He feels like, well, I don't really want to be part of that system, but at the same time, you know, it seems important to um to spread the message. And I think um one of my favorite lines from um from David's books and one that is probably widely misunderstood but has become a very um a very kind of uh, widely quoted line from David um, is when he's talking about this concept of hypocrisy, um, which is something Mark gets all the time. Like, who do you think you are, you know, publicizing your stuff through The Guardian when you're saying you're living a low impact life and all this stuff? Um, and there's a wonderful part in Lean Logic. So one of the one of the themes that runs through his book is um, looking at argument and logic and um, that a lot of the kinds of solutions we need are not followed because people are misled by um, invalid arguments. Um, and talking about hypocrisy in Lean Logic, David writes, if an argument is a good one, dissonant deeds do nothing to contradict it. In fact, the hypocrite may have something to be said for him. There is no reason why one should not argue for standards better than one that manages to achieve in one's own life. Indeed, it would be worrying if our ideals were not better than the way we live, which I think is, is quite a subtle point and could be taken as a, a sort of justification of hypocrisy, which certainly isn't um, how it's intended. But but a, a sense of being a little more tolerant with the inevitability of being hypocritical when we're you know, 
most of us born into a culture which um which is ecocidal you know which is taking us down a route that we absolutely reject and of course you know if no hypocrites were permitted to hold opinions there would likely be no opinions at all um i remember russell brand i think said something like uh when i was poor and i complained about inequality people said i was bitter um now i'm rich and i complain about inequality and they say i'm a hypocrite i'm beginning to think they just don't want me to talk about inequality so i think um i think that uh nonetheless we should be i think we should largely ignore other people accusing us of hypocrisy but i think we should be very carefully listening to our own spirit when it suggests that maybe we're not living up to our ideals as much as we could be um and yeah that big question about how do we balance living in a way that makes sense and is is local and is convivial with um spreading the word about that um i'm afraid i don't have any pithy wonderful solutions to that i think that's a classic example of do nothing that matters without consulting a conversation i think we just all need to keep um keep exploring this stuff together um and it you know listening to um listening to the little voices inside ourselves i suppose is the only bit of advice i'd give on that um i mean certainly i found that i couldn't i couldn't ignore what i knew about for me particularly the environmental um eco side that's going on and be happy um for me it, it sort of required that i at least attempt to act on it uh in order to live a wholehearted life and um and i think that's the best we can do i mean as i've mentioned this phrase a couple of times but you know for me it's the meaning of life is tell a story with your life that you're wholeheartedly proud to tell that if on your if on your deathbed you had to um honestly account for your life would you be proud and thrilled to do so for me that's that's what i want my life to look like and i'm not sure yet what story makes sense i personally uh, revile uh mainstream large-scale advertising and marketing is one of the most destructive tools in the world um there is an incredible piece of work which i would point you towards on this um which is called the uh common cause report um i'll just look up a link for you to it um because that grappled with this in the most potent way that i've seen um and that was um yeah basically arguing that part of the problem with mainstream advertising is that it 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 isn't honest about what um about what what it's advocating for you know it'll have you know, sexy beautiful women selling you coca-cola which in fact if they drank any significant amount of it they certainly wouldn't look like you know super slim models um and so there's this real um contradiction between the values that they show you and the values that they're actually trying to sell you um and a big part of the argument of common cause was that um you know maybe we do need to yeah absolutely tom compton is one of the key people and here's a link to my blog that i wrote this was back in 2010 the report came out but i think it's still very valid um this is the blog that i wrote when it came out um which talks a bit more about that um and really yeah i'm afraid i don't have a fantastic pithy solution to the question but i think it's a really important one for us to keep grappling with and hopefully some of you will be you know sitting in a in a pub or a bender sometime um and we can chew the fat on it a bit more um but for now we're nearly um nearly at the end of our allotted time for this um for this conversation um so i think what i'd like to do is um give the final word to david fleming seems only appropriate um and i think given the way that this conversation has gone see one of the wonderful things about david's work is it's so wide-ranging and covers everything um at one point in order to try and convey the wide-ranging element of his work um i i did a couple of events where i uh i just asked the audience to shout out questions on any topic at all any topic at all whether it's got anything to do with what they know about david fleming or not uh, and for all of them i was able to speak to it from lean logic to give a sense of the breadth of it um and uh so yeah i think in this case i'm going to read i mentioned before that he talks a lot about uh, logical fallacies and and the art of argument in the book it's one of the many threads that run through lean logic um 
And this is the entry on the fallacy of distraction. Distraction is diverting attention from the argument. Consider the proposition that two plus two makes four. Distraction might urge, for instance, that the idea is old fashioned, that the time has come to move on from traditional thinking on the matter, or that it is too technical for the public to understand. It could take the form of an ingratiating assurance that the only thing that matters naturally is the well being and happiness of everyone concerned. Distraction might urge that it's perfectly okay nowadays to think that two and two makes five. Or that even thinking about it marks an unforgivable neglect of the far more important proposition that three and four make seven. You might be invited to note that there is money to be made by taking a different view of the matter. Or that we have to move on from the notion that if we are to be competitive. Or that the proposition is a bit rich coming from someone with a private life like yours. Or it could insist with some passion that, contrary to the view that two plus two makes four, we must take our place at the heart of Europe. Distraction might add, with hope for finality, that the argument has already been lost. Two and two is going to make five in the future, whatever we do. Distraction evidently has the power and freedom to cause havoc wherever it likes. It is a spoiler, worse than the cheat. The cheat at least recognises the existence of the rules on which argument depends if it is to make any sense, even though he then proceeds to break them, hoping not to be found out. Distraction recognises nothing except conquest. The argument is too serious to have any connection with the orderly rules of honourable play. It will be settled by other means. Rules what rules? It presumes the death of logic. A characteristic form of distraction is to make an assertion which is not true, but which is hard to disagree with. This happens, for instance, with that appeal to the inevitable. The distractor does not argue for or against a proposal. Instead, he simply asserts that it's going to happen anyway, and he may do so in a slightly bored drawl that passes off the sellout as if it were a routine comment on the weather. Don't stand for this. It is one of the ways in which our citizens' right to have a say in deciding for ourselves dwindles into a loss of belief that we can influence anything at all. It is designed to induce give up itis, an acceptance that technology and the sweep of history make the decisions. What we are then supposed to do is to surrender, to make sure we are not in the way. So that's David's sort of, well, one of his sort of invocations to um, reclaiming the power from the, you know, the great sweep of history and from the economists who claim that little details like, you know, how much we get paid and how many hours we spend at work are far too mathematical and complicated for the likes of us to worry our little heads about. Um, and so much of his work was about making that stuff accessible, making it um, available to, you know, to ordinary people. Um, so I'll, I'll just I'll post a link here for if people want to um, follow up, if people want to know more about the books, um, about some of the reviews the books have been having, the awards they've been winning, the film um, that's coming out, which I'll just link for as well. Um, then this is the place to um to follow up this is a website that i'm i control the fleming policy center now um with all the latest so that the first link is about the books the second link is about the forthcoming film you'll see some trailers on there which we've done amazingly actually we put these trailers out a couple of months ago and they've already had over three million views um through facebook and youtube so people are really um getting excited about the message which is really wonderful um i think we had one or two people from north america so sterling college in vermont are running a course on david fleming's work a week-long course in june um and uh if anyone wants to join uh the mailing list i have a personal mailing list around these books i send out an update maybe every few months um at that first link i've just posted um at the very bottom of the page you'll find a sign up form and you can also view the previous updates so you can see whether they're the kind of thing you'd be interested to receive in future. Um, so uh, I think it only remains for me to, um, oh, actually share a poll quickly. I've got one last poll, which is just about um, how you found this webinar. It'd be nice to get some feedback. Um, certainly Kat would be interested. And big thanks to, to Kat for hosting and to, um, for making this, uh, yeah, making this whole thing happen. And um, hopefully we're going to, be collaborating more around um, David's work and the various CAT courses 
and um, thank you all for joining and um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Oh, nice feedback. Good to see. <laughs> thank you all. It's been really nice to uh, meet you <laughs> in the way that we have. Oh. Lots of feedback.